photosynthesis. That's the topic of the day. There will be bunches of questions on your AP test about photosynthesis. First of all, what kinds of things can do it? Plants. Some bacteria. Some bacteria. And? Algae. What's a, a, a word to describe anything that can do photosynthesis? Autotroph, photosynthetic, producer, any of those things where primary producer, recognize those words. Things that can do photosynthesis. You got to know the equation for it and the reactants and the products and those kinds of things. We know that we need some light that provides the energy. We need CO2, which plants get from where? From the air. And they take it in how? Through the stomata. Um, and we're going to go ahead and balance this equation as we go. We know they need water. And they get the water through the roots. And that process of pulling that water in is? Transpiration. Transpiration. And we know that typically they make sugars. And usually what's the sugar? Glucose. Glucose. And then they give off oxygen. And where does the oxygen come from that's given off? I mean, these O's, where did these O's come from over here on the left? The water. Because what happens to water during photosynthesis? It gets split, ripped apart, snugged, and that's called photolysis, and that's where the oxygen comes from. But that's your balanced equation. The reactants for photosynthesis and the products of photosynthesis. And again, a word for another word to associate with photosynthesis is productivity. If you talk about uh, gross productivity, what are you talking about? The total amount. And you don't take out less use for Exactly. The total amount of photosynthesis done. It could be the total amount of sugar made, it could be the total amount of what given off. Oxygen, it could be the total uh, mass of plants made, but something to do with how much photosynthesis is done. That's gross productivity. Now, if we look at net productivity, that's the gross from some photosynthesizers, and then take away what? Yeah, what they use. What they use during, Joey already said it, what they use during cell respiration, which they're kind of opposites, right? Photosynthesis and cell respiration basically do opposite things. All right, if we look ahead a little bit, I think we covered most of these terms already. Remember that chemosynthesis is a similar kind of thing. In photosynthesis, light energy is converted into chemical energy, usually in the form of glucose. Um, when we talked about the things that can do that. But some things don't have any light. And they're at the bottom of the food chain. They're producers. They do this process called chemosynthesis. The difference there is basically what's the original source of the energy. It's usually sulfur-based chemicals, and where are these things usually found at? Like vents down deep in the ocean where there's not much light, and they get their energy from these chemicals, these inorganic chemicals, and they use that energy to make organic chemicals like sugars and such. It's very much like photosynthesis, but the original source of the energy isn't light. It's some kind of other chemical. All right, I think what we want to do now is look at a picture of a chloroplast and think about where photosynthesis happens at. In most plants, where's photosynthesis mostly happening? What organ of the plant? The leaf. And then we, if we zoom into the leaf and we look at the individual cells, what organelle inside those cells? Chloroplast. And if we zoom on into the chloroplast, we see the little follicles, which are those little bags in there. Um, that's where what part of photosynthesis happens? The light dependent part, which always has to have the first. And what's located, embedded in the membranes of the follicles? What's stuck in the membrane of the follicles? The, the pigments, the photosystems. And in between those photosystems, of what things that we talked about in class today, if you were in an A class. Cytochromes, the little proteins that do what? Carry electrons and pump 
Um, so that's the basic setup. We, the, remember, the, the chloroplast has a double membrane. You see two, two cell membranes there. It's got lots of little thylakoids. What's the term for a stack of thylakoids? Grana. And then the fluid filled space in between those is called the stroma. If you know that, you know pretty much what you need about the, the structure. There's a little different picture of it. I think what we want to do now is draw um, draw out a thylakoid, and I'll try to do that on here. I'm just going to delete this slide real quick. Okay, so if we draw a thylakoid up here, this is one thylakoid out of many. Embedded in the membrane of that thylakoid are big hunks of pigments. We call those big hunks of pigments what? Photosystems. And remember they're numbered backwards because of the order they were discovered in. And think of a photosystem like a solar panel. It's a group of light absorbing pigments. Mostly what pigments? Chlorophyll. Mostly chlorophyll. But there's other stuff too. There's yellows and oranges and those kinds of other pigments. But regardless, as those pigments absorb energy, all the energy that they absorb gets funneled to this guy in the middle, which kind of looks like our eyeball. And what do we call that molecule of chlorophyll A in the middle? It's called the reaction center, the reaction center. So all the energy gets funneled into this guy, this molecule of chlorophyll A in the middle. And eventually it absorbs so much energy that what starts moving really fast? It's electrons. And eventually they move so fast that some of them pop out. What do we call that when something loses electrons? Oxidation. They get oxidized. The reaction centers lose electrons and out they come. Now, remember in general, the reactions that leave photosystem 2 hop across um, this set of cytochromes, the electron transport system. And as they hop across, moving from um, uh, less electronegative to more electronegative, what's their energy used to power? The pumps. And the, the, the pumps, these things are also carrier proteins. They pump H. Plus. Which way do they pump it? In this case, into the thylakoid. It gets pumped the other way in cell respiration, but in photosynthesis, H. Pluses get pumped in. So we start to build a, a gradient of H. Pluses. Because if we're pumping it, what does that mean about the way we're moving it? If, if we use that word pump, that means we're doing what kind of transport? Active, Active which means we're going against, against the gradient. So we're, we're, we're already don't have many H pluses outside. We're building up a bunch inside. What do they want to do? They want to get out, but they can't because the thylakoid membrane is made out of what? Phospholipids, and it doesn't like positive and negative things, right? So they're stuck. But the more that we pump these things in, the more they want to what? Get out. So it's a way to basically store energy. It's almost like creating a battery. It's called an ion gradient. The electron that left photosystem one over here ends up combining out here in the stroma with a chemical called what? NADP plus. NA what? DP plus. It's a um, a nucleotide. And so that electron combines with that, and so it's actually two electrons. And that should be let's fix that. Two E minuses. And some hydrogen to make NADPH. So NAD plus gets what? Since we're adding electrons to it. Reduced. And this NADPH is basically a form of what? Stored energy. Because whenever you add electrons to something, what do they carry with them? Energy. Energy in this case that used to be where? 
what made those electrons move in the first place? The sun. So this is stored sun. Stored sun, a form of chemical energy. Now what we've got left to do, photosystem one got an electron back from photosystem two. So it's happy. It got oxidized and then it got reduced. But photosystem two lost some electrons too. Where does it get its electrons back from? Water. And it has to rip it apart. Kill the water molecule, mug it. And when it mugs it, what's left behind from a water molecule? Some, some more H pluses and some, some O, right? Now, what do we know about O by itself? Can't happen. So two waters have to get split. A couple of, uh, a molecule of O2 is made. And where does most of that O2 end up? In the atmosphere. It has to get out of the plant. There's so much. There you go. But do plants need some O2? Yes. Yeah, because they have to do what? Same Cell respiration, just like you do. But they make more oxygen than they use. There's one thing that we haven't talked about yet in this light dependent part of photosynthesis is this little protein down here. And what's that guy called? ATP synthase. And remember, it's an enzyme, but it's also a what? A channel protein. And when it opens, the H pluses rush out of it. And I use the word rush because there's a really big what? Gradient. Gradient. So they move fast. And this thing's able to use what kind of energy do things that are moving fast have? Kinetic. It's able to use that kinetic energy to take ADP and P plus that energy and make some ATP. That way of making ATP using uh, energy from a, an ion gradient, a proton gradient. What's that called? Chemiosmosis. So, so this whole picture we're sometimes going to call non-cyclic what? Non-cyclic photophosphorylation. And there's basically three products of that that are made. And those three products are the NADPH and ATP and O2. And the, the two that are really important for the plant are the ATP and the NADPH because they're forms of what? Energy, stored chemical energy. Now, I already said that the purpose of photosynthesis was to take light energy and come to, to use it to make chemical energy. Have we accomplished that here? Yeah. So why bother making sugar? Why bother doing the second part of photosynthesis? ATP and NADPH are both really reactive. Can't store it for long. Right. So you have to convert it into a form that's a little bit more stable, a little bit less reactive. And that form is what? Glucose, sugar. And that's where part two of photosynthesis comes in. But, but before we get to part two, most plants are doing this all the time non cyclic photophosphorylation. That's one form of the light dependent part of photosynthesis. But a lot of plants are also doing a slightly different form of it at the same time, and that's called cyclic photophosphorylation. And it only involves which photosystem? Number one. And instead of the electrons moving from, from water to photosystem two to photosystem one to NADPH, the electrons just move in a circle. They leave photosystem one and eventually come back. So what's never made in this variety? NADPH and also what else doesn't need to be made? Oxygen, because there's no need to split water. But what is made, the moving electrons still build up what kind of gradient? H plus, right? Still are pumping hydrogens, so you're still making ATP. Most plants, most things that do photosynthesis are doing both of these things at the same time. Cyclic and non-cyclic. So they end up making lots of ATP, some NADPH, and giving off some oxygen. Three products of what part of photosynthesis? Puts the whole cyclic and non-cyclic together are called the light dependent part, right? And this is happening, obviously, 
only when when it's locked now what comes next Calvin cycle before we get to the Calvin cycle though some reminders chlorophyll is a, a protein right a pigment it's green why is it green because our eyes see it green when it bounces off. Light hits it. The green wavelengths of light bounce off. They're reflected. But what do we know about the red and the blue? They're absorbed. And that's what this diagram is showing. The chlorophyll is really good at absorbing red. It's, it's, it's really good at absorbing blue. It's pretty good at absorbing red. It stinks at absorbing green. Um, what element? Is a uh, chlorophyll protein built around magnesium? Plants need a lot of magnesium to build chlorophyll, and that's one of the reasons it's good at absorbing light. So let's talk about the Calvin cycle. First of all, the Calvin cycle happens where in the plant? The stroma. The liquid part of the chloroplast. I think I'd rather look at this picture. So carbon dioxide is pulled into the plant, into the stroma, and there's this enzyme, rubisco. What's another name for rubisco? R-U-B-P carboxylase. And that enzyme's job is to do a process called carbon fixation, which basically means it takes CO2 and it combines it with this five carbon molecule that the plant already has a supply of. So it attaches CO2 to RUBP. That's why it's called RUBP what? Carboxylase. And, and so we've got five carbons here plus one here. And we're doing three sets of this at the same time, essentially. So three of these plus three of these gives you three of these. Five carbon thing plus a one carbon thing should give you what? A six carbon thing. But if you look at the diagram, it tells us that this six carbon thing that we make, it's, un it's unstable. Why would that be unstable just from looking at it? <laughs> it's got two phosphates attached to it, which means it's got a lot of what? A lot of energy is kind of unstable. Breaks up. And it breaks up in three six carbon things, break up into six three carbon things. Those are called PGAs. They're kind of like half a sugar. But half a sugar without as many what? Well, electrons is true, but without as many calories is what I was going for. Without as many much energy, because what we're going to do in the Calvin cycle is basically take the CO2 and add what to it. The the main idea of the Calvin cycle is to take CO2 and add what to it? Energy from ATP and electrons and energy from NADPH, both of which were made when? During the, light. During the light part. So we're supercharging the sugar in the Calvin cycle. That's what we're doing. We're charging it up. So here we use we uh, apply energy from ATP. Here we apply electrons and energy from NADPH, and we're charging this thing up until eventually these six PGAs become six what are called G3Ps. These are essentially half of what? Half of the glucose. One of those gets taken out of the cycle, and it'll be used to build sugar. The other five are used to do the last part of this process, which is just regenerating our UBP so that the cycle can keep going. So it happens in three main steps. Fix the carbon. Reduce the carbon. And reduce again means what? At energy, electrons, and usually what else? Hydrogens. So that's happening here. And then finally, use the other five G3Ps to regenerate our UVP. Now these, this one G3P that got taken out, it might be used to make glucose. But what else can a plant make from that? Sucrose, cellulose, starch. Uh, and they can use the energy from it to make proteins. But, but anything the plant needs, it can use this to build. That's the calculus. Does that make sense? Everybody good with that? All right, we got a couple, a few minutes, so.
Let's talk about the different kinds of plants that can have issues with this. Most plants, especially around here, are called what kind of plants? C3. And C3 plants are great as long as it's not what? Not too hot or dry. When it becomes hot and dry, they are they need to do what? Close the stomata. Because it, what's happening through the stomata? And that's called? No. Transpiration, right? They're losing water because of transpiration. Now, if the ground is already dry, that's a problem. Now, if the ground's wet, is it an issue? No, it's not an issue if the ground's wet. But if, if the ground's dry, that becomes a big issue. They have to conserve water. So they close their stomata. When they close their stomata, they can't what? They can't breathe. Because that's what the stomata are for, is breathing, right? They can't breathe anymore. So what do they start running out of inside the leaf? CO2. And what starts to build up inside the leaf? Oxygen. And that becomes a problem. And we'll get back to my analogy here. This Rubisco enzyme, R-U-B-P. We, we use that analogy, sort of like the cheating husband with a wondering eye. As long as CO2 is around, he's on his best behavior, right? He knows what he's supposed to do. He fixes CO2 to R-U-B-P and photosynthesis works great. But when CO2 starts to become less common, CO2 is out. CO2 is only going to be out when? Unless the lot are closed, and that's probably only going to happen when? When it's hot and dry. But when, when the concentration of CO2 starts to drop, Rubisco is equally attracted to what? Oxygen. And instead of attaching CO2 to this, it starts attaching oxygen to RUBP. Does that lead to anything fruitful? No, it actually leads to these waste products. That when the cellmates get open, and when it has enough energy and time, what does it got to do with those waste products? It's got to use energy to fix that. So this, this is a big drain on photosynthesis. Whenever they have to close their stomata, C3 plants don't do the Calvin cycle very well, which means they start running out of food. They start wasting energy. And that problem is called what? Photorespiration. Molecular adultery. Molecular adultery, but photosynthesis is the word, I mean, uh, photorespiration is the word we want to use. But that's a problem for C3 plants. Now, there are other kinds of plants that have evolved to deal with that differently. Here's what a normal leaf looks like in a C3 plant. What do we call this waxy layer on top? Cuticle. Cuticle. Keeps it from drying out. The middle of the leaf is called the mesophyll, the middle part. And that's where the photosynthetic cells are at. Down here are the stomates. And what are the cells on either side called? Guard cells. And then in the middle, we've got this tube. And that tube is a vein. What's in that vein? What two kinds of tubes make up the vein? right? And then you've got some cells around that tube called the bundle sheet. That's what a C3 plant looks like. But C4s notice the anatomy is different. They still have some stomates, they still have a cuticle, but the, the vein is surrounded by a thick layer of cells, a thick bundle sheet. And here's the deal. In, um, in C4 plants, they have another enzyme out here in the mesophyll. What's it called? Pep carboxylase. It fixes carbon, but it has no attraction for what? No attraction for oxygen. So it fixes the carbon, and then that fixed carbon gets transported to where? The bundle sheath in here. And who's locked away in the bundle sheath to keep him out of trouble? Rubisco. And the CO2 gets released back in here again. But since it's a little bitty tube, even a little CO2 makes what happened to the concentration of CO2 in that tube. It makes it be high. So he can work. And the enzyme out here, PEP carboxylase, can work even when what's going on? Even when the stomates are closed, because he has no attraction for what? Oxygen. So PEP carboxylase fixes oxygen, fixes carbon dioxide out here, and transports it into the, the bundle sheath where Rubisco can work, because it's basically always keeping what high? The concentration of CO2. So that's a good thing, and that allows C4 plants to open and close stomates when they need to, and therefore be able to conserve water. It's about water conservation. 
So they fix carbon in one place and do the Calvin cycle in another place. It's said that those two things are spatially separated. Carbon fixation and the Calvin cycle separated by space. Around here, what kind of grass might you have in your yard if it's a C4 plant? Bermuda. Like, I have Bermuda in my yard, and it's still brown. It's starting to get a little green. Why are C4 plants dominant here? Because it's not always hot and dry. Yeah, they're not very good at dealing with the cold. They're good at dealing with hot and dry. In August, when it's hot and dry, Bermuda grass is going to be nice and green. But in uh, March, when it's still cool, it's going to be brown. You might also have what kind of grass in your yard? Fescue. Fescue. It's really green right now. But come August, because it's a C3 plant, what happens when August hits Alabama? It's dark, it's dry, it's hot. And the, the egg grass is green, it's a little dark and brown and ugly um, because it can't handle the heat. Corn is also a C4 plant. And I will end today by talking about the other kind. The other kind of plant is cam plants. Cam plants are the best adapted for hot and dry. They're plants like what? Cactus. Cactus. You know cactus, that's good. Also like a, an orchid, pineapples, those are cams. And, and what they do, what, what happens to most plants at night? They kind of take a break, right? It's like they're almost napping, they close their stomata and they sort of shut down. Um, they may still be doing the Calvin cycle, but, but they close their stomata for the most part. But cam plants don't do that. When the sun goes down in the desert, what's it like? It's cool. Um, so they open their stomates. And what are these cam plants doing all night? Breathing in CO2 and fixing it and storing it. They use pep carboxylase and they store the carbon as an acid. Sometimes it's called chrysulian acid. That's where the cam comes from. Or it may be called malic acid. But they store it as an acid overnight. As soon as the sun comes up, what do they do? Close their stomachs, and then that carbon that they've been storing all night, what happens to it during the day? It gets released. And it breaks it off, and it's released in the cell. And then what enzyme can work? Because there's constantly it's constantly being released, even though the stomachs are closed. Rubisco, and Rubisco is the one that starts up like Calvin's off. Every plant has Rubisco, but they use it in a different way. Some plants fix carbon with this first, and then provide the fixed carbon to Rubisco later. Um, in cam plants, it's said that carbon fixation and the Calvin cycle are separated by time. And what have we been saying in class? That's called temporal, temporal separation, separated by time. Um, that's great because their stomachs aren't open when it's wet. When it's hot, when it's dry, they keep them closed and therefore they can do the best at conserving what? Templates. And one more quick thing I will mention. I kind of already mentioned it when we started. Productivity. We already said that primary productivity is a measure of photosynthesis, right? There's a little more sciencey sounding definition. It refers to the total amount of solar energy converted to chemical energy by the process of photosynthesis. Um, if we want to calculate the gross and net productivity, remember that gross primary productivity, GPP, is the total amount of chemical energy produced before any is used. Now, that's probably not worded exactly right, because can we produce energy? Might be better to say total amount what? converted from solar to chemical, or total amount stored, or something like that. You can't make it. But it's the total amount of energy that's stored up, usually as sugar, during photosynthesis. And then the net primary productivity is what's left after what? after cell respiration has used whatever it's going to use. So if you had to calculate net primary productivity, this, you would say the net primary productivity 
is equal to the gross productivity, what's the R stand for? Minus respiration. And that's, that's a pretty easy calculation. Questions? You guys feel okay about photosynthesis? All right, we will stop.